welcome to the Making Nice with Naughty podcast, where we delve into the art of intimacy for the rule-following, organized, perfectionist, practical, and color within the line types. I'm your co-host, Dr. Tom Murray, a licensed marriage and family therapist, certified sex therapist, and the author of the book that started it all. Hi, I'm Dr. Frances Robbins, a psychiatric mental health nurse practitioner. My background includes a master's degree in nursing and international health, along with a doctorate in business administration. We're here to explore the world of intimacy in a way that resonates with even the most structured and detailed-oriented individuals. In Making Nice with Naughty, we uncover the secrets to navigating intimacy for those who thrive on rules, order, and perfectionism. Join us as we discuss practical insights, expert advice, and personal stories that will guide you through the journey of connecting intimately while staying true to your organized and rule-following nature. Whether you color within the lines or prefer a perfectly outlined plan for everything, we've got you covered. (laughs) So buckle up and get ready to explore the fascinating world of intimacy. With us, Making Nice with Naughty is not just a podcast. It's your guide to a fulfilling and organized love life. This This is is Making Making Nice Nice with Naughty. Naughty. Let's Let's dive dive in. in. Welcome back to the Making Nice with Naughty podcast. I'm Dr. Tom Murray. I'm Dr. Frances Robbins. We're so delighted to have you as we go through Making Nice with Naughty, an intimacy guide for the rule following organized perfectionist practical and color within the line types. In this episode, we dive deeper into uh, chapter seven, Uh, which is the um, anxiety chapter, how to make friends with anxiety. So I understand, Francis, you've taken a a deeper dive into this chapter. Um, What uh, stood out for you? Well, thanks, Tom. And again, it's always great to see you. You know, our last episode, we talked about the OC's anxieties and how they related to sex and sexual perfectionism, and then how to identify those anxiety producing beliefs, along with the value of anxiety. So today, I wanted to spend some more time and discuss um, kind of into a deeper dive, right, about the unhealthy anxieties and how best to confront them. Mm. And I, I really, as I was reading through your, you know, your book, I'm reading all about Kirsty and <laughs> Megan and all these other people that you have in your book. Yeah, uh, I think we can all relate to unhealthy anxieties and how they affect other people, right? And mm. that we have, we it's it's kind of easy as we've talked about before. It's easy to see. It seems like it is to say, oh, they're having an anxiety. This is their anxiety. It's like, it's easy to identify it in other people. Mm. It gets more difficult when it's yourself. Right. And, and um, in, your, in your chapter, in, this, in your book, in this chapter, you really go in and you spend a lot of time about those anxious thoughts and, and uh, you define it you know, as the mind chatter. Mm-hmm. And I thought... First of all, your writing is amazing. And the fact that you speak to so many people through your words that folks can relate to you. And it's as if you're an OC yourself, Tom. <laughs> Shh, don't tell anyone. <laughs> so you had, you had said that, you know, OCs pride themselves on their logical thinking. Mm. And yet these anxieties are are birthed out of speculation and irrational belief. So that's mm. kind of an interesting paradox, right? If they're very logical, yet they have all these other things. And we had already discussed in previous chapters or previous episodes about rational emotive behavior therapy, REBT, right? right? And that that was just another, it's a method for those over-controlled folks to identify their irrational beliefs. And then And then in your book, you spend a lot of time talking about Ellis, who was the one who kind of started this uh, REBT, and that that really is the root of their anxieties, is these irrational beliefs. So I was going to ask you today if you could kind of spend some more time talking about those irrational beliefs and how it is the root cause of their anxiety. Yeah, you know, when I when thank you for that, um, that summary. And, and 
what comes up for me is a lot of us who are prone to anxiety, as, as, as we've talked about in prior episodes, over-controlled people, what they fear the most is uncertainty, right? So, so they're mm-hmm. really clamoring for a, a sense of certainty because of what certainty provides, a sense of safety. And so it's ironic, just to underscore what you said earlier, is how certain people can be about an uncertain future. Yes. Right? Yes. The future is inherently uncertain, but the mind, the, the, the ego, tells themselves a story and they become so convicted that I will be humiliated in the future. I will be embarrassed in the future. Right? Uh, or How my do they partner. Know? Right. Or my partner will be judgmental or critical toward me. And so they're very, they're absolutely certain about this uncertain event. And that um, fuels that, that uh, anxiety. To kind of um, attach to that, right, is Ellis talks about through rational emotive behavior therapy. So REBT through that he talks about the ABCs of emotional disturbance. Yes. And this was so helpful for me. And I even was thinking about it even outside of the context of the bedroom or intimacy. Yes. It's so profound. And I I just want to read what you have in your book. So the activating event, that's the A, the activating event When a perceived threat happens in an environment around you, so it's perceived, so it's the future, or you're just thinking whatever, a perceived threat happens in the environment around you, triggering your negative emotional or behavioral response. That's that Mm. activating event. Then you have your core beliefs, and beliefs is the B in ABC, which describe your thoughts attached to your response. And then C, the consequence, which is your actual emotional response and action taken as a result. Yes. That's in everything. That's in everything. So, so again, another way of, of, of framing this is that life is happening around us and that life is inherently, that life that's happening around us is inherently neutral right? Mm-hmm. It's, it's neutral, but, but we have our consequence. We have anger, resentment, anxiety. We have uh, a love. We have feeling good. All of those consequences to these events that are happening around us. And, and, and one of the, the illusions is that the event is causing me to feel those things. But there's a intermediating or a mediating experience, which is the belief. It's my belief about these events. It's Mm -hmm. do I perceive these events as good? Do I perceive these events as bad? Do I perceive these events as my enemy or my friend? And it's that belief that leads to the consequence. And so if someone is experiencing Mm -hmm. a consequence that is uh, maladaptive. So consequences can be adaptive or they can be maladaptive. Mm-hmm. And, and people have problems in their lives uh, you know, by definition when they experience maladaptive uh, uh, consequences. And, and so you're absolutely right. Once you begin to see it, you can't unsee it. Oh, it's everywhere. And it's, it's, um it's interesting. I love one of the things I really enjoy doing as I'm walking through the the book is I love to take that information and apply it to my, obviously my own life, but then also like when I'm watching a a show on Netflix or Hulu Mm -hmm. or something, and I think about, oh, well, that's the, that's an activating event (laughs) (laughs) or, and, and to see, um, you, you're so right. Once you see it, you cannot unsee it. Mm-hmm. I, I, um, the events are, our environment is neutral. That's, that's a very, that's a very Buddhist thing. Is it not? Well, you, I, certainly, um, uh, uh, the Stoics, 
right? So yeah. the, 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 the philosophy of Stoicism um, was also very much in this line that, that, uh, of thinking where it's not um, a life happening to us that causes us to feel the way that we do, but it's really our judgments about our life experience that cause us to have yes. the feelings that we yes. have. Yes, yes. In the context of making nice with naughty, if you, if you were raised or you, for wh wherever you were inundated with your core belief, however that was, mm. if your core belief is something that says, um, sex is for, let's just say it's for having children, right? People have intercourse to have babies. And that's the only reason that they have intercourse. And it's very, it's a very, um, scripted event, right? If, if you, um, uh, if that was your core belief and you were with a partner and they use birth control or maybe they're, um, they, they don't have any intentions of having children or there's just the, the, re the union of the two people will never make a baby, you know, mm. whatever, whatever the reason behind that. I can see how somebody with that kind of core belief, it would be difficult for them to engage in the act or the intimacy because their belief is this is only something that I do to have children. I, we're not obviously going to have children, so I don't do that. Yes. And, and you can see embedded in that a, a, a way of looking up at sex as, as performative. Mm -hmm. In other words, we have sex because of a particular outcome that is to have mm -hmm. babies. And if we're not, if we're not planning on having babies, then sex doesn't have any utility. Therefore, if my partner is wanting to have sex, but not wanting to have a baby, that can be very confusing, mm -hmm. right? Um, versus a pleasure-based view of sex, having that belief that sex is about pleasure versus sex is about performance, you, mm -hmm. can, you can naturally uh, uh, see how that consequence of a pleasure-based belief about sex results in a positive feeling about sex. Yeah. And even what you just said, how, define pleasure, right? There's a rule behind what is pleasure. How do you know when you're having pleasure? How do you know if your partner's having pleasure? Well, these things will be evident. And that's a rule in itself that, that an OC could get hung up over. That's right. That if, if for example, um, I must have an orgasm in order uh, uh, for sex to have any valid, value, mm -hmm. uh, well, then um, if I don't have an orgasm, well, the natural consequence of that would be uh, a disappointment, frustration, mm -hmm. anger, mm -hmm. resentment, bitterness, all of these kinds of uh, uh, myriad of emotions that show up in my office because people are so firmly attached to a particular uh, belief. And, yeah, and it's if I may, uh, how this mm -hmm. relates is earlier in the book, we talk about the fixed and fatalistic mindset, <laughs> right? The, fa the fixed and fatalistic mindset are just talking about two types of belief systems. Um, but there are certainly specific thoughts those systems can be broken down into so that when when readers are paying attention to their own mind chatter, they might be able to classify their thoughts as, oh, that goes into the fatalistic camp or that goes into the fixed mindset camp. I think that it's, it's important for people to be able to identify that and to realize what their, what their core beliefs are and how that does affect the the consequences and just when you when you spend some time looking at the the effect of what is happening and 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 can can dig into 
like that activating event, what are your core beliefs, all that kind of stuff with the help of a trained person. And in this case, a therapist, it, it, to me, it would seem like it, once they get it, getting it might be a little difficult, but once they get it, it's gotta be life changing. Mm -hmm. Well, in the end, what it does is it, uh, uh, brings about a sense of agency that if I'm not getting what I want out of life, it's best to assume that you're not getting it because of something that you're thinking or doing, right? Uh, it's best to start there. What am I thinking or doing that's getting in the way of me having what I want? If you start with what is the other person doing or thinking or feeling, then you can't possibly know that answer, right? You, or you can maybe know what they're doing, but you certainly can't know with certainty what they're thinking or feeling. But if we start first with what am I thinking and doing and feeling that may be getting in my way, and then you may you still may conclude, oh, there's nothing really that I'm doing that's getting in my way. And you can then be thinking about what the other person is doing. But even if you were to go there, the the the, the reality is you you have to still only focus on what you have control over. Otherwise, when you focus on what you don't have control over, you're most likely to experience a state of despair and whatever flavor that might come in. And that can certainly lead to a maladaptive way of living. That takes a lot of that takes a lot of self-discipline, I would think. Not that OCs are short on self-discipline, but to but to be <laughs> but to be able to do that self-reflection. Yeah, yeah. In in RODBT, we call that self-inquiry. Self-inquiry. Right? The the ability to kind of ask yourself, am I am I struggling in my desire to create a life worth sharing? Right? Through these these ways of looking through the looking at the world that keeps me from having the kinds of connections that I want. Mm -hmm. uh, to give you an example, we um, we use uh, uh, a, a thought uh, that loving partners are spontaneous when it comes to sex. Right? Well, if I have a belief, that's not that, true. Yeah. <laughs> Well, if I have a belief that sex should always be spontaneous uh, and that if it's planned, it's just not sexy, right? But in modern life, particularly if you have young children, if you have uh, uh, dual career families, life is just incredibly busy. And so planning sex can be a, a, a useful way of prioritizing sex. And dare I say, planned sex can be exceedingly erotic and hot. In fact, that's what affairs are. Affairs are 100% scheduled sex, right? We're going to meet on this evening at this hotel and, and, and there's all that excitement, all that buildup. But what happens in my office is I hear a lot of people complaining about uh, scheduled sex. But what they're really saying is that it's not exciting because there's no build up to it. There's no sending messages of, I can't wait to spend some time with you on Thursday night. I look forward to pleasuring you. I look forward to connecting again, right? Uh, there's not the build up. There's just, okay, let's put it on the calendar. I'll see you on Thursday. <laughs> and then what does... I was going to say, in the South, they call that wooing. <laughs> I need to be wooed. In many people's lives, it's more like uh, 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 wanting. <laughs> they don't want, they, it won't happen, right? Because they, they, they associate the idea of planned sex with this boredom, with this lack of excitement. And of course, I get that. Nobody wants to just slap something on the calendar and and and, and it turn into just another item on the to-do list. Right. Right. No, that's very interesting that an affair is a planned is planned sex, but that's I mean it it's um 
That is indeed what it is. There's a, there's that we're going to meet. It's not, I don't know. It's not like they come together and they decide to play cards. Right? <laughs> or they're... I mean, it's all very clear why, why yeah. the two are meeting and, right. and it's, it's a, it's interesting the, to think about it that way. Yeah. So in addition to that being one of the dysfunctional beliefs, another common dysfunctional or maladaptive belief that I hear in my office is that sex mustn't be awkward. Sex mustn't be awkward. And if I have a client where, let's say, the husband experiences awkwardness, uh, it may be that their spouse or their partner judges them for experiencing awkwardness and then says to them, if you're going to be awkward, I don't want you to right, uh, uh, approach me. And, and of course, they have the rule as well that sex mustn't be awkward. And to me, <clears throat> I don't know about you, Francis, but my first time having sex was awkward. And it didn't stop me. <laughs> right? I mean, there's Correct. a lot. <laughs> Correct. Correct. It is. It, it, and, and I would love for my couples to frame awkwardness as a symbol of, of learning something new, of trying a new way of being in a relationship. Mm -hmm. And that... Anything that's worth doing, anything that is worth doing in life is worth being awkward first. That's very true. I think about the, the, um, the excitement of curiosity mm -hmm. and mm -hmm. just being curious in, in framing that awkwardness. Yeah. But OCs just absolutely feel that in order to do something, they have to have great certainty that they're going to be great at it from the beginning. Because they, what they fear is the judgment, mm -hmm. right? They don't want someone who's going to judge them for uh, uh, any inadequacies, right? We as OCs go to great lengths to um, uh, obscure our, or hide our inadequacies from other people. We don't want that because then, of course, we would feel vulnerable, right? And right. and uh, uh, we like to shy away from vulnerability. It's so, it just, it's interesting to me just how the evolution of the awareness happens through, through the therapy. Say you more about that. Well, just what do you mean? In in that, um, you know, the OCD OC person is kind of going through life, and and they're experiencing a lot of things, but they haven't connected necessarily that they're the that they're the source of their ah, right. of their of their woes. Yeah, especially if they're looking and they're saying it has to do with other people. So That's there comes right. some kind of a moment, some event, I'm guessing something happens that they start doing some introspection, right? Start yeah. looking at what, am, what is it that I'm doing? And, 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 and when that happens, how they, how they just seem to, the rest of it maybe falls into place. I think that that's a, a an excellent uh, observation um, because OCs, one of the core deficits of OCs is that we tend to disregard or ignore critical feedback. And life is constantly giving us mm. feedback. Yes. Right. Life is constantly giving us feedback. Um, uh, you know, there's a quote, uh, uh, Oprah, uh, we, we had cited Oprah um, earlier on in the book when we talked about um, uh, uh, Morrison and Toni Morrison and, and Oprah would, would often say um, failure is the evidence. Is, failure is life telling you that you're moving in the wrong direction. Right. And, and I think because uh, uh, for us OCs, we can be, we can be absolutely assured 
of what uh, direction we should go. And, and those particularly who have that fixed mindset are, mm -hmm. can, can be like, I'm ab that's the absolute. Right. Um, I, 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 I remember I was in a relationship once where, uh, um, this person had this goal and, and they, they wanted to have, uh, 30 publications by the 30th birthday. Right. And that was, uh, 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 they were just absolutely adamant that they were going to do that. And, and certainly they, they exceeded that. And, and in many ways, again, that ambition is what is so rewarding about the OC temperament. I mean, you know, we OCs, we set our mind to something, we can certainly cut through whatever obstacles are faced in order to, to get there. But what we may leave in its wake are attending to important relationships in our lives. I think, I think that as you say that so many different people come to my mind, you know, that mm -hmm. are, that are, um, so they appear so driven mm -hmm. and, and, um, yet they're struggling in all these other arenas, yeah, struggling well, I, alone. I would imagine for you having been in the military and mm -hmm. having, for me, having patients who've been in the military Mm -hmm. And the military seems to be an institution that uh, 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 has has uh, ample amounts of for fertilizer for the OC temperament. <laughs> yes. <laughs> right. And uh, what I have seen clinically is that OCs, <clears throat> particularly uh, people who are in the military or those kinds of institutions, be it. Uh, uh, police force, uh, uh, be, be it hospital settings, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. That they want to apply the methods of operation that are so successful in those settings and bring them home mm. and, and have little soldiers as children, as spouses, right? And, and just mm -hmm. wanting the systems to operate in the home life mm -hmm. uh, uh, and everyone be as as mm -hmm. uh, persuadable, pers persuaded to their um, uh, preferences because they know that that those preferences are working in those other settings. Sure, I mean you can see that. I think about that even outside of the military and like the um, airline industry, the air, the pilots mm -hmm. with their all their checklist. What about the air traffic controller mm. who has to have absolute certainty about everything? And, and I'm sure that I'm sure that, that an OC is their personalities probably sway them into those arenas where they can have absolute control or perceived mm -hmm. control. Um, with the military was, was interesting and was one of the reasons there was lots of reasons why I actually separated from the military after 10 years of being in the service was the higher ranking I became and the more active I was with the, um, with those in command, you become privy to meetings and, and you, you kind of get to see behind the veil, right? So mm -hmm. you get to be, you get to see behind the veil and you realize that these, that your leaders who you want to exemplify have some serious problems going on with their relationships with maybe substance abuse, maybe, or just, I shouldn't say substance abuse, maybe just their habits that are self-destructing mm. and, and you become kind of privy to what's the inner circle. And it, for myself, it was, it was very discouraging because I could see people who I would have thought you know, had it all together and a life I certainly would exemplify. And then when you really like see what their life is, I realized, okay, this is not working out. This is not a good environment for me. So I separated. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. 
But that is, that's very true. The military definitely has that. And then the other piece of with the military that just makes it just kind of grows. He's talking about fertilizer. It's like the, you know, the, the, uh, what's the, the best fertilizer in the world, whatever it is, you know, that miracle grow. So it's yeah, the miracle right, right. grow for OCs is, is because the military, typically you're on station or in your job one to two years, maybe three, but everybody is on some sort of rotation. So if you're working in an environment and you don't get along with your boss, there's really good certainty that your boss is on there is getting ready to transfer out. Mm. Or you don't like somebody that you work with, the likelihood is they're, they're transferring out or you're transferring out. So there's not mm. a long term like commitment. You know that, okay, I'm, they're only going to be here. Many people will start looking up when are they due for a transfer and then they'll keep a track. They'll keep track of that. Okay. So they're going to, they, they're, they're going to be transferred in about 10 months. Okay. Good to know. <laughs> That's when you know, it's going to come what that part of yeah, your life is going to come because through. well, and then, and then just in the bureaucracy of things as people, the, uh, this whole, this whole, uh, phenomenon of quiet quitting that's mm -hmm. been going on in the military since it's probably its existence since the beginning. So as soon as they get the date, they get their next assignment, it might be 10 months, six months before they actually make that transition. They they're quietly quitting. They've checked out. <laughs> so yeah, I'm sure we can all, we can all relate to uh, working with people who, who certainly have done that. Yeah. Hello there, dear readers. I'm absolutely thrilled to announce the release of the Making Nice with Nadia audiobook, narrated by yours truly. As the author, I've poured my heart and soul in telling your story, especially how your psychological temperament shows up in the bedroom and how it gets in the way of intimacy. With every sentence, every emotion, I'm right there with you, guiding you through getting more meaning and fulfillment in your sexual and intimate relationships. The wait is over. You can now download the audiobook on Audible or from my website, drtommurray.com, and immerse yourself in where you reclaim the playfulness of your sexuality. My voice is your compass as you navigate through every titillating moment, gaining powerful insights from psychology. Claim your aha moment, click on the link, and join me on this unforgettable journey toward making nice with Naughty. Making Nice with Nadia audiobook, available on Audible. Download now. But back to, back to, you know, Making Nice with Nadia and kind of looking at this, at this piece, I do want to spend some time, you, in, your, in this chapter, you actually discuss methods that we can use to debunk and deconstruct those negative thoughts and emotions and those, that negative thought or emotion or response is that activating event, right? It's what triggers your, something happens and you get this emotion. You talk about one of the ways to debunk it is through what you call, here's a, you know, newsflash, get more information, <laughs> get information you lack because the OCs are jumping to conclusions. Are they not? That's right. That's right. It's a lot of, of, of mind reading. We love to mind read. Mm -hmm. Right. So, or some of, some people call it the invisible audience, right? So we're, we're, we're concerned about uh, uh, what other people think, how other people feel. We do a lot of social comparison. So how do you get more information? How do you know that you're lacking information if you're so adamant that things are going to be like they are? Yeah, so uh, uh, I offer, um, uh, well, we talked in, in prior chapters this idea of if a thought is heavy, mm -hmm. it mustn't be true, right? So we've, we've gone through uh, that being an example. Um, and so then if it's not true, that uh, is the invitation to do, by the way, the D, Right. So ABC. So we talked to activating event, 
The belief mm -hmm. about the activating event leads to the consequence. The D stands for dispute. So what are we disputing? We're not disputing what happened. We're not disputing that you didn't get the erection, mm -hmm. right? Uh, uh, but we are disputing the belief about not getting a, uh, an erection. So if the belief says, uh, uh, I'm not a man because I didn't get an erection, or I'm a total failure because I didn't get an erection, and then therefore the consequence is shame, embarrassment, mm -hmm. anxiety, mm -hmm. <clears throat> I can dispute that, that uh, belief. Uh, uh, and so when I dispute that belief, then that leads to having um, a, a new experience or a new effect, right? Mm -hmm. So the, the, the ultimate goal <clears throat> is to move into a flexible mindset. Right? And one of the ways that you do that is by um, uh, getting... Uh, information that you lack. And so I talk about two methods of doing that, the flexible fantasies and the anti-awfulizing, anti-absolutizing yes. strategies. Yes. So when I first read flexible fantasies, I was, I was just thinking more of like contortionist sex. I was going to say, <laughs> bending, literally bending over backwards. Yes. But it, uh, I, but which when can I, be fun too, which can be well, fun too. I, I, it sounds like it would be awkward, right? <laughs> but the flexible, so with the flexible <clears throat> fantasies, um, this I thought was so interesting too, Tom, because it's basically, it's basically kind of changing what those rules are mm. and, and being able to, um, kind of the the example that you give in the book i i'd ask you just kind of spell that out for us so people understand but it's something that we all can do and we don't it's just something we can do in our own mind yes. that that you don't necessarily even have to share with anybody so That's you can right. do this you could practice this without being vulnerable to your partner mm. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. to see yeah, if it so, even works. Right. So an example, uh, just broadly speaking, I would, of course, encourage listeners to uh, dive deeper by reading the book, is that what ultimately is the outcome that you would want? So because we can't control whether we have an orgasm or we can't control whether we have an erection, that that those those are our bodies responding to uh, uh, both internal and out, uh, uh, external stimuli. We, since we can't control them, uh, in the event that you didn't have an orgasm, in the event that you didn't have an erection, for example, uh, what would the feeling be that you would want to have in those moments? So, for example, if someone is in a state of despair because they felt uh, embarrassed or, or ashamed. Well, what would be an adaptive, what we call a negative adaptive emotion or an adaptive negative emotion to an event such as uh, 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 not having an erection, not orgasming? Well, an adaptive negative emotion might be disappointment. Hmm. So, I go, I, uh, maladaptive is despair because it alienates me from my partner. If I'm in a state of despair, I'm going to be alienating myself from my partner. I'm going to be so inside, so in my mind that I'm not going to have an emotional connection with my partner. But if I'm in a state of disappointment in that, you know, it would have been nice to be able to, to, uh, uh, enjoy sex with my partner in the way that I had intended. Uh, uh, my preference would have been to have this experience. Uh, but I didn't have this experience and, and I'm, I'm capable of having other experiences. There are alternatives that I can also do uh, 
uh, to have a pleasurable uh, moment with my with my partner. And so I'm going to do those things. So yes, I'm disappointed, but there are alternatives. I would imagine that as you ex- as you expand or experiment on those alternatives, and you have a positive a positive experience from those alternatives. Now that disappointment isn't isn't necessarily there because you get you're having pleasure from these other alternatives that you would have never have thought about had mm. had the event never occurred. Right, right. What I love about this method too is a lot of people think you can choose your emotions. You know, you know, people will, in pop psychology, they'll say things like, choose to be happy. Mm. I think that is total bullshit. And it's kind of like gaslighting, mm-hmm. right? Mm-hmm. We, can, we don't choose how we feel. But what we do choose is the context. We, can, we have some agency in creating a context where mm-hmm. a particular feeling is a most likely consequence, Mm -hmm. right? And that context can be in here in the form of a belief, right? Or we can can restructure an external context about which that, that that is also influenced by certain beliefs so that we can have the kind of feeling that we want. Now, does it guarantee that we'll have the feeling that we want? No, but it, it's no. about creating the potential, putting right. that, putting that, that into place, that cause and effect into place that increases the potential for that feeling. And an, an excitement brings a level of excitement too. Whenever there's a potential of of something positive, that's that's exciting. It can be. It can be very exciting. And, and you know, one of the things that I think is interesting about OCs, and maybe this is true about non-OCs too, I, you know, I, I can't be certain. A lot of OCs can confuse excitement with anxiety. Right? They, 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 they may be excited, but they internalize it as anxiety. Because it can have somewhat of a similar uh, uh, autonomic uh, experience, right? And because, um, in by and large, uh, 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 over-controlled people are not all that excitable, right? I know that I, that's certainly true <laughs> for me. I don't. I just don't get really excited about things. Right. In fact. It's been a liability in relationships in the past because, you know, um, people might perceive me as being all that disinterested. Yeah. Right. Or not invested. It's just that uh, we have the the it would take it would take a considerable amount of activity to get us really activated. Yeah, I. I think that's interesting that you said the excitement being confused with anxiety. I don't, I can see how that could happen because of the, a lot of the similar uh, physical responses, as you just said, the sweating, the, the heartbeat increasing, the, uh, just um, the heightened awareness of things, you know, it's, in in many in many senses it is except that it excitement is is more is a positive it's deemed positive or anxiety which it's all neutral you know <laughs> the events yeah the events are all neutral but our perception right. of them is is so different it but i i can see uh i have never thought of that honestly until as you said that and i think about when i've been I've treated folks with anxiety and uh, it certainly it certainly um makes me want to ask more questions about the context of their anxiety because it may be excitement well we can even 
we can um, see how this might work in other ways. So a panic attack, for example, mm -hmm. is associated with this sense of out of control, uh, with this, often with the sense of uh, dying, right? Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. and, and so there's a lot of cognitions associated with the anxiety that precedes a panic attack. Right. And so if you are someone like you and I, uh, it's not possible for me to have a panic attack. It's, it's, it's just not possible for me to have a panic attack because I understand the, the, what, uh, the preceding experience, which is anxiety, right? right? I understand it. And then I don't tell myself a catastrophizing story about how right. awful it is, how I'm going to die. I'm having a heart attack. Uh, it, it, this is uh, the, the I'm, I'm feeling out of control. I'm going to lose control. I'm going to be judged for losing control. None of that happens because I'm willing to sit with the anxiety that precedes it. And so that gives you an example of how people can even misperceive anxiety and it goes worse in the opposite direction. So if that's true, it can go worse in the, in the opposite direction. Could they misperceive it? Uh, can they misperceive excitement? And it also goes worse, mm -hmm. right? So it's just a transmutation of an experience. Uh, and I think that that happens a lot based on the story we tell ourselves about our experience. I agree. I agree. The, I would, I would almost disagree with you about like, you could never, I'm, I'm so not in the land of absolutes, but <laughs> the reason I say that is yeah. because if you have a belief that you are having a heart attack right. or going to die based off of what's happening in that moment, when you have, if you truly have that belief, I promise you, I promise you, Tom, you're not going to sit there and think, what was the precursing event that caused this? You're gonna be like, I'm <laughs> dying. Well, but is that, can that be, can you, can someone have the thought of I'm dying and not be in a state of panic? Well, yes. Right. And yes. So it may be actually true, but I'm talking about, like, if I know that I'm having an anxiety attack, mm -hmm. which I have, you know, mm -hmm. um, my, my anxiety is much more hormonal based. I've, you, you've helped me to come to realize uh, <laughs> that, which I've appreciated. Um, and so I don't have catastrophizing thoughts associated with the anxiety. Mm -hmm. Right. Uh, and so I'm, I'm just aware of the sensation of anxiety and it, in my anxiety hits me in the middle of the night where I wake up and I'm, I, I have a, a fl flooded with some anxiety. Mm -hmm. uh, and parenthetically, I, I'm, I need to more data points, but I think it's associated with eating, having too much to eat before bed. Uh, and, and there's some kind of response. I don't know if it's mm -hmm. a blood sugar but since I don't tell myself a story about it, it can't transmute into a panic attack. I think it's that bridge. The bridge is the story. I, I agree. Um, I, can, yeah. I can see that. I can see that. And I would say to a lot of our folks that are listening and watching us today as we go through this, those folks who have panic attacks, anxiety attacks, whatever you want to call them, um, learning to manage them is the key to living with them. Mm -hmm. And when you man it, you know, you don't want your anxiety to manage you. And, and, um, many times I'll see or hear people that will say just out in the community, uh, well, I just couldn't do that. I had so much anxiety about it. Like you give so much effort and, and you give so much, uh, strength to anxiety. Like it's defines who you are. I'm just an anxious person. That's right. You know, that's exactly right. So yeah. I, I, I just, people that do have panic attacks or anxiety attacks and they're in this place in their life where they just kind of feel like, well, that's my lot in life. These are the cards I've been dealt with. I'm just an anxious person. My mother, father were anxious, whatever, fill in the blank. They, they don't have to live that way. They it, don't. And there, mm -mm. and there's, there's a, a you know f certainly pharmaceutical support um uh a, a uh, 
uh, I'm fascinated by um, people who are recommending warheads for oh. panic attacks mm. uh, because you put that sour taste in your mouth oh, yeah. and all you can think about is the sour taste. Yeah. That's, <laughs> Knocks that's, you out of it. I can see that. And then um, I, I just... I can see a point of the therapy end of medications as well. My, um, my message to everybody mostly would be just, there's no, you don't have to live a life like this. It doesn't have to define you. And if the soon as you let those anxieties define you and you start giving into the anxieties, the anxieties take over and you become less of a, less of you and more of the anxiety and it doesn't get mm. better on its own. Mm. That's what I would From say. A from a psychiatry perspective, yeah, you know, what I've I've kind of struggled with as a professional around this conversation uh, about anxiety is that uh, I view that we've we've um, uh, medicalized and monetized distress and anxiety being one of them, uh, and and and. Part of that monetizing it is um, implying that people can get rid of their anxiety, that they shouldn't feel anxious. And I'm wondering, from your kind of how do you how do you uh, um, uh, balance the the clear evidence that anxiety as an emotion has been an important part of our evolution as a species, our success? Right, that as an emotion, and then, the, and, and and presumably that it's a normal mm -hmm. human response, mm -hmm. versus this, this, what seems to be the commercialization, if you will, of, of getting rid of it. This idea of getting rid of anxiety. Sure, sure, and it's all about discomfort. I mean, we're we we are we are inundated with methods to be comfortable no but and we become a very uh, some with with discomfort comes strength comes resiliency and when i talk to people about anxiety or they come to me and they say uh, i'm having this i you know i've got anxiety we spend a lot of time and i tell them we start off with normalizing it to you know it's not something that it's a, it's great. It's great that you have anxiety. If you didn't have anxiety, that would be a problem. You need, you need to have that. So when I would talk to him about the value of anxiety, where I, where I come in and start looking at is what is the anxiety preventing them from doing? Hmm. Where is the, where is it that they are, um, not enjoying life, not participating in life as they would like because of anxiety, which is just a fear. So you could have, you could have a, um, a couple who is, um, one of the member, one of the, uh, couples, one of the people of the group is just, they have anxiety related to going out on a date. They don't like to go past the certain place or they have all kinds of rules that's preventing them from having a, a, a deeper relationship. They are not mm. able to go mm. to their job because they have this, all this anxiety. They're fearful of when they face something, they're going to have a panic attack. And then the panic attack is so distressing that the panic attack or the fear of going to have a panic attack is debilitating and prevents them from doing what they really want to do. Mm, that's when I, mm. that's when I say, okay, we need to, we need to rein it in, but there has to be a level of, of discomfort and you have to be able to, you have to be able to guide them through the discomfort, knowing that as they're exposed to this discomfort, even the panic attack, many, 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 many of my patients have had panic attacks while we were in session. And that's great because I can wait for it to pass. Nobody dies of a panic attack. <laughs> that's right. There's no judging. And it just happens. 
And as once it's happened and they've, and they've recovered, we go on. And mm -hmm. it's events like that where I'm not, oh my goodness, do go call the ambulance, do this, do that. But it would just makes it, it, I kind of help normalize it for them so that they don't see it as a debilitating thing. Right. You know, so the anxiety is super important to our species. I say, if we didn't have anxiety, we'd all be dead because anxiety mm. is our breaks. It mm. stops us and causes us to think. The problem is that our body can't differentiate what's a real threat versus uh, a perceived threat. Mm. Mm. So, you know, you're that, that, uh, somewhat leads to that that awfulizing that I mentioned earlier. Yes, you know, with being, yes. being the second piece, is that the mind wants to tell you that this this activating event is so awful, right? Mm -hmm. um, and and claiming it as awful uh, uh, leads to that despair or that that anxiety, that terror. Right. Uh, I, I years ago, I heard a psychologist say. Awful. Is getting third degree burns over 90 percent of your body. Oh, my gosh, that is right. And bad, it's, bad. A, a, it's a way of re not recalculating, uh, but uh, 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 kind of resetting what your brain is saying is awful because if your brain says something is awful that is uh just an inconvenience um then it's going to feel huge mm -hmm. but when you compare it to something that you can imagine third degree burns over 90 percent of your body well it's definitely not that whatever this activating event is is definitely not that right well then it makes it way more tolerable or there's a there's an awfulizing scale, uh, for example, that mm -hmm. um, uh, comes out of the REBD li literature. And so sometimes I'll say to clients, on a scale of zero to 100, 100 being the worst possible thing you can imagine, how awful is this experience? And they'll, they'll, they'll be, oh, a 90, a 95, right? Well, on the scale, anything above 50%, or anything above 50 is um, removal of body parts. Oh. So a like let's go with a 25 would be or I'm sorry a um a a a, a 75 or something would be a removal of your non-dominant arm. Mm. Right? So it just goes it just gets in, up until 95 would be removal of all four limbs, 100 of course would be death, right? And and then on the other end, it's non per it's it's uh, non it's temporary hurt, right? So um, maybe a, a a broken arm, a broken leg, all the way down to a a a, a punch that doesn't cause a bruise, you know, like mm -hmm. a which it would be a, a like a two or a three. And so I will sometimes say, well, what would you rather experience a a uh, uh, would you be willing to experience me punching you, even if it doesn't leave a bruise, in order to not have this feeling, right? And so they'll, they'll say yes. And so it becomes a way of recalibrating how their brain evaluates these activating events so that they can see, oh, life is hard, right? Right. Life is mm -hmm. inherently hard, but their hard is not as bad as their mind wants to tell them that it is. It's not third degree burns mm -hmm. over 90% of their body. And so if we can go from a 95 all the way down to a five and realizing, oh, this isn't that bad. It, it sucks. Don't get me wrong. No one wants to be punched, right? Mm -hmm. But it, 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 it sucks, but it's just not as bad as their mind wants to tell them. Yeah, that's a, that's a great analogy. It's a to be able to put something on a scale that's tangible, you can anchor it, you can see, and everybody's kind of on the same page. The, um, I have to tell you this, it's just a little side humor. 
Yeah. When I read this for the first time in the book, anti-awfulizing, anti-absolutinizing, um, I can't even say that word. I thought of, I thought of Batman. You mm. remember how Batman had his anti-shark bite spray or anti this spray and he had like on his tool belt. <laughs> yeah. He yeah. had all the anti got my empty yeah. and that was like his magic powers or whatever batman so i thought about have the can anti-awfulizing this is my anti-awfulizing <laughs> strategy now we're, we're we're talking about the superman from the the tv series yeah I'm yeah guessing. whack yeah. boom yeah. bang whack. you know <laughs> yeah i have yeah. my anti-shark my shark repellent right anti-shark spray <laughs> So I love that series. I did too. What I appreciate is being able to walk through these different strategies with you and, and really spend some time in kind of normalizing these events that we call anxiety and, and our body's response to the anxiety. It is healthy for all of us to have these experiences. And it's healthy for us to work through those experiences without it being debilitating. And when you do that and you, and you get a, a win, a score, you know, it makes us, it makes us more resilient and stronger. And that's right. And as people go through as the OCs, as they're reading the book, if they're, if they're in chapter six, they are definitely an OC. <laughs> they're committed. They're committed, right? They're going to be reading this and thinking, you know, this is just genius, right? If they if they take it, if they take it to heart. You had um you had talked about also some uh emotive dramatic different uh exercises about developing healthy responses and, you know, the shame attacking exercise, risk taking exercise, and then emotive verbalizations. Can you kind of expand a little bit on those so we could maybe get some more clarity around that? Yeah. So if we're looking at uh, shame, for example, uh, and that is a powerful emotion oh, that yes. uh, many OCs are, are susceptible to. We want to do well. We want to perceive, be perceived as doing well. And <clears throat> despite our general appearance of competence, a lot of OCs have this not enough-itis, right? I'm not enough. I'm not talented mm -hmm. enough. I'm not smart enough. I'm not capable enough. I'm not, you know, pretty enough, sexy enough. There's, there's this not enough. And as a result, there can be a shame associated with it. And so shame is a, a, a sense of us as a person being defective, right? Where, where guilt is, I did something bad. Shame is, I am bad. Mm -hmm. And for a lot of people, particularly those who have grown up in, in communities, churches, families, where sex was, was shrouded in this uh, shame component, mm -hmm. and you were shamed because you were uh, 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 found to be self-pleasuring, and, and, or you were shamed because you had amorous feelings for someone. Uh, and that can be that can start to shape, again, those belief systems that then are used to interpret those uh, activating events that, that are happening um, to you on a, a, a daily basis. And, and so the, the way to dismantle shame in, that I review in the book is really tapping into this uh, uh, playful nature. Right. Um, and and yeah. that that playfulness can be very hard for over controlled people. Right. Because playfulness often means feeling awkward. And as we've talked about earlier, uh, uh, we tend to shy away from those experiences where we feel awkward. It's just where you're being silly. Just being silly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And then, and so then 
what about the risk taking exercises? Is that where you're doing something knowing that you're uncertain about the outcome? So you do it anyway as Yeah. Yeah, so it would be it would it, it, the risk taking exercise is to allow yourself let me let me back up. Okay. Uh after a, a a end of a of a long term relationship, I did have uh, uh, unrelenting anxiety. Unrelenting anxiety. I would wake up with anxiety. I'd go to bed with anxiety, mm. and I had never experienced this kind of anxiety before in my life. Uh, in fact, as a clinician, before this experience, had you asked me or told me rather that one could experience anxiety like, like that, I would have been like, no, no, that's, that's not how anxiety is experienced. Right. Uh, and so I had life, you know, I was young and I had life experience now that proved me wrong. And, uh, uh, I had a, a therapist who encouraged me to get on a benzodiazepine. And I, uh, went to my, uh, uh, general practitioner and and initially she wanted to put me on an antidepressant and i i balked at that because i said i'm not depressed i'm grieving uh 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 and uh, but she eventually gave me the the anti-anxiety medication well when i got the prescription filled mm -hmm. and i was sitting in the car for someone who had never up to this point ever taken a psychiatric medication uh, I was sitting in the car and I held this bottle in my hand and I realized that now I have a question that I didn't have before, which was, could I experience more anxiety than I'm experiencing now and still survive? could I experience more anxiety than I am experiencing now and still survive? And the answer was always yes. So that bottle was in my medicine cabinet, but it was a symbol. It was a reminder that in the case of an emergency, I could break the glass. Right. But I would ask myself the question, could I experience more anxiety now and still survive? And in, and, and so in, in a similar vein, that risk-taking exercise is asking the same question. Could I experience more awkwardness than I'm experiencing now and still survive? <laughs> well, take that risk. <sighs> everything that you've ever wanted in life, everything that you've ever wanted in life is found just on the other side of comfort. Yes. Yes. If I want to learn something new about myself, I have to take that risk. I have to step into that space of awkward, of discomfort, of not knowing, of mystery in order to have something different in my life. And remember, a big uh, um, a definition in RODBT of mental wellness is, is cultivating a life worth sharing. Yes. Yes. Well, I get, to, if I step in that, in that, that realm of discomfort, I'm not talking about diving into the deep end of it, but I'm just stepping into the, the kitty end of discomfort mm -hmm. so that I can still have my feet firmly grounded on the bottom of the pool, but um, water is only up to my waist. Well, I can survive that. <laughs> I can survive that much anxiety. Right. Right. Now I'm, I'm learning something new about myself. Yeah, that's exactly correct. And it's that awareness when that happens. And as soon as you know that and you've gone through it and you've experienced it, even if it turns out to be the worst experience of your life, but you still have experienced it, mm. it really reduces the effect that anxiety has on us, the negative yes. effect. It's like right. turning on the lights in a dark room. Yes. It's not scary anymore. That's right. You know, right. it's, it's, a, it's a very, it's, it's quite a, um, it's quite uh, liberalizing, you know, gives you freedom to just, it's, 
a quite a wonderful feeling when that happens. And I'll have to tell you as a clinician, it's very exciting when I see my patients do that. Right. You know, I'll give you an, uh, this past week, I had the uh, honor and privilege of talking to 70. Uh, they were mostly f- uh, uh, female physicians mm-hmm. and uh, talking about the book, making nice with naughty. And uh, uh, one of the uh, audience members talked about, well, how do, how do I get my spouse to mix things up? Right. And, uh, and so I said to her, I asked her, um, who's the first person on the bed when you're having sex? And I already intuited the answer. Mm-hmm. She was. <laughs> well, don't be the first person on the bed. That is an example of a risk. That's, it's somewhat yeah. minor, but it's an yeah. example of a risk. Or I said, uh, what percentage of the time when you have sex, do you have sex in the bedroom? And she said, 100% of the time. Well, do you realize that when you pay your mortgage, you actually pay for it for the whole house? <laughs> <laughs> that you can actually have sex in any of the rooms that you want. It doesn't just have to be the bedroom. That's right. Right. So those are the kind of risks that I'm talking about. Yeah. Uh, and, uh, and I'm sure readers and listeners can think of many other ways that they can lean into their anxiety uh, and, and just uh, uh, um, shake it up a little bit. What about the emotive verbalizations? I have to remind myself, Neil, make sure you block this out Um, (laughs) or or, uh, cut this out. What is that? Um, I'm on, it's on, uh, uh, I don't know what page it is on, page uh, 169. Um, is yeah, there, people largely. Is there something in specific? People largely create their emotional anxieties by holding them vehemently, strong beliefs and negative attitudes about themselves. For example, people struggling to orgasm may feel convicted that they must achieve it by, so let's see. Um, your mind may also have focused on fairness. For example, it's so unfair that I experienced this and no one else seems to struggle with this struggle. And then you say, this is where you talk about singing happy birthday. Like, ah, um, yeah, that's right. Changing the statement, the feeling in the statement and then singing it. Try, so you say, your mind may have also focused on fairness. For example, it's so unfair that I experience this and no one else seems to struggle as I struggle. Notice how you feel inside amid such statements to yourself. It feels heavy. It doesn't it. Now here's something silly to try. I'd like you now to repeat your statement about unfairness, but at this time, sing the statement out loud to the tune of happy birthday. Go ahead. I'll wait. What did you notice about how those very same thoughts feel differently? So it's, it's in the, it's in the delivery. Right. That's right. Right. So I added, a. I just realized we can add, I don't know. Uh, do you have a Mark clip button on your side? I do. Yeah. So whenever we need to, whenever we know that we want something deleted, we can um, oh, good. do that. So, um, yes. Uh, emotive verbalizations are these uh, uh, very strong beliefs that uh, we say to ourselves. And one of the examples that I give is around fairness. OCs are, 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 uh, fairness is really important to OCs. Equal, is it equal? It's like, you know, cutting a sandwich. You know you have an OC child. <laughs> you know, they're looking to make sure that the peanut butter and jelly sandwich is perfectly oh my. Uh, 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 cut so that it's it's fair. 
And uh, one of the statements that an OC <laughs> may say is, it's so unfair that I experienced this. And no one else seems to struggle as I struggle. And you can imagine mm. if you go inside, that's a heavy. Yes. That's a heavy thought. Yes. Right. Uh, uh, and so one way to kind of break that log jam is that uh, you uh, uh, say the exact same words, but to the tune of happy birthday. Right? That's impossible. Are you able to do? Are you able to do that? Are you able to sing happy birthday with it's so unfair that I experienced this? So it'd be da 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 da. So it's so unfair that I experienced this and no one else seems to struggle as I struggle today. <laughs> excellent, excellent. So you can already <laughs> tell you can <laughs> you can feel how yes. that the exact same words yes take on a total different energy yes by doing it in a way that's silly like singing happy birthday to it that's awesome that's awesome and then to to just at the end of all of this this is what i uh i appreciate you have a you, at the the end of the chapter you talk about acting your part and how a lot of this is behavioral act your part. And you say to that end, I encourage my patients to engage behaviorally in sexual activities with themselves, such as masturbation and with their partners, such as having sex without attempting in an intercourse, instead of avoiding those anxiety producing activities. I encourage couples to work on relationship problems instead of avoiding them and repeatedly practice specific actions until they're proficient. Mm. And then you said, which I think this should be cross-stitched. <laughs> I'm not aiming to help you feel better, but rather to help you get better at feeling. Yeah. Oh, oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah. That needs to be on cross-stitch in your office. That, I think, is fundamentally the job of a therapist, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right, is that life is hard. And when clients think that the only option for them is to be happy all of the time, yeah, then they're they're uh, uh, avoiding the the they're avoiding living life, right? Because life is inherently hard. There are things you know. Life happens to us, and we respond to it. Mm -hmm. And how we respond to it is what becomes then the story of our life. Right. Right. It's so good. It's so good. I am, this has been an excellent, excellent, excellent time with you going over this, the anxiety. And, you know, I really appreciate this discussion, Tom. It's helped me and I'm sure it's, it's bringing some uh, comfort to those that are listening and hopefully gives them a, some, some curiosity and some uh, give, we're giving them the permission that they might need to go out and experience life as uncomfortable as it is. Mm -hmm. I, I, I really appreciate this. You know, next time we meet, it's going to be on, we're going to go through chapter eight, taming the monkey. Taming the monkey. I look forward to spending that time with you, Francis. Thank you so much, Tom. It's been a great, great time. And that wraps up another episode of Making Nice with Naughty. We hope you enjoyed our exploration of intimacy for the rule following and organized. Thank you for joining us on this journey. If you found our discussions helpful or intriguing, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and leave a review. Your feedback means the world to us, and it helps others discover the podcast. Plus, it lets us know what topics you'd like us to cover in the future episodes have questions or you want to share your experiences, connect with us on social media. You can find us on Facebook, Instagram, YouTube, TikTok. <laughs> Links on the description. <laughs> and for more in-depth insights, be sure to grab a copy of my book, Making Nice with Naughty, available on Amazon and Audible for the audiobook. Thank you again for spending time with us. Remember, you can be both organized and adventurous in matters of the heart. 
until, until next, next time, time, keep, keep making, making nice, nice with, with naughty. naughty. To renew your passion and ignite your desires. <laughs>